Greetings Dragon Ball fans and welcome to the fifth part of my Dragon Ball What If series. What if Vegeta killed Gohan? In the last part we saw Gohan escaping the time chamber with the help from Bulma. The now physically grown man struggles to adjust to life outside of the void, but adjust he does. He has also found some measure of peace with Bulma. They even have twin children together. Now, traveling back in time to try and save their fallen comrades, the bulbous time ship pops into existence above a small Capsule Corp warehouse in the outskirts of West City. It hovers for a moment, then descends to the ground. After seven figures emerge from the ship, it shudders and collapses in on itself. The group gather up and fly off towards the wastelands, where they settle down to the ground and enjoy lunch while they wait. A massive freezer ship descend. King Cold steps out followed by a rather bored-looking but somewhat larger version of Frieza. Frieza Force soldiers come pouring out after them. They stop short as two balls of cheerful energy and a streak of green crash into the soldiers, knocking them away like bowling pins. Cold beckons his older son, but stops when he notices two other figures floating down from above. The man slams into Cold, sending him flying back into Cooler and then to the ground by their ship. They barely have time to untangle themselves when they are grabbed and thrown back into the air. A massive beam of energy engulfs them both as they tumble. Meanwhile, the group of Frieza, or I guess cold soldiers, have been disarmed and are being shoved back towards their ship by the two kids and the teenage Namekian. When the ship lifts off and flies away, the slim man and Namekian float off towards the onlooking but slack-jawed Z-fighters. They land in front of the group, and after a while, the awkward silence is broken by Bulma's shriek. Following her gaze, the Z-fighters see... another Bulma? Older, wearier, but definitely Bulma. Perhaps we should all sit down, the older of the two says, reaching out and squeezing the thin, bearded man's hand reassuringly. Boys, she calls out, and the two almost identical, spitting images of Kid Goku come out from behind a rock, with another teenage-looking Namekian in tow. She introduces them all to Akumu and Akujin. Then, pointing from the younger Gohan to the thin man next to her, she introduces future Gohan and their boys, Goku and Jinbei. Chi-Chi stumbles forward to look at her older, slightly gaunt son. The older Gohan falters a bit as he steps towards her, and they embrace for a long, quiet moment, tears flowing freely down the older Gohan's face. Having done some arithmetic, Yamcha interrupts this tender moment by blurting out that Bulma looks great for someone who's almost 70. And a mum so late in life? Wow. This breaks the younger Bulma's blank stare, and she slaps Yamcha's arm before meeting her older, confidently smiling self's face. They make awkward conversation for a while, with the younger Bulma and Gohan glancing at each other and cringing from the embarrassment at the casual affection their future selves seem to show for each other. Eventually, two pods streak across the sky and crater nearby. Goku and Piccolo are both flabbergasted to meet two Gohans, Bulmas, Piccolos, and Mini-Gokus, though one of them has turquoise hair. The older Bulma then wrecks their joyous reunion by laying everything out, Terminator 2 style. The teenagers who end up being cyborgs, Goku's death, Vegeta being rebuilt somehow, the massacre at Goku's funeral... Each new bit of information bring gasps from the crowd and sobs from Chi-Chi. Trapped alone for decades, her poor baby boy. Piccolo awkwardly asks Akumu and Akujin if they would like to visit Kami. As they fly off with Tien and Chaotzu in tow, future Gohan sighs in relief. He's not at all sure how he should feel about Piccolo. Being around Akumu for so long, though, has tempered his reaction. They do look almost identical. The younger Bulma makes her awkward goodbyes as well, and she flies off with Yamcha back to Capsule Corp. Chi-Chi then invites the rest of them back to Mount Pauzu. They gather around, and before Goku can touch his forehead, they appear at their old home, having been instantly transmitted there by the older Gohan. At the lookout, Kami is thrilled to meet his descendants. He is not at all awkward about it, though, having watched the initial encounter and listened in via Piccolo. Sensing some of the power hidden within the young Namekians, he suggests that they and Piccolo spar. Akujin quickly picks up many of Piccolo's techniques, and to Piccolo's amazement, he shows how to curve and guide the Makanko Sapo. Kami also shows Akamu some of the powers befitting the Dragon Clan, including the creation of Dragon Balls. They also compare Kaiokens with the two future Namekians, showing what Akumu and Gohan have worked out in the time chamber. 
Having heard about the horrors of it firsthand, Kami decides that some changes may need to be made to the room. Over at Mount Pauzu, the younger Gohan shows his, uh, kids around. While he really wants to talk with his older self, it's just so awkward. Not to mention that weird fizzy sensation he feels around the man. Krillin, meanwhile, sits in the corner watching Bulma and the bearded Gohan interact. Having finally noticed the fizzy sensation surrounding the future Gohan, and recalling those two massive powers vanishing before he arrived, Goku asks if they can spar for a bit. The older Gohan's smile vanishes as his hair starts to lift and flicker in anger, but Bulma appears at his side, distracting him. With future Gohan's hair settling back down, Goku excitedly asks if Gohan is a Super Saiyan 2 now. While avoiding his father's eyes, there is a brief flicker, and future Gohan's hair, beard, and tail shift smoothly from black to bright golden green. Little Goku and Jinbei appear at the door with concerned looks on their faces. Young Gohan arrives behind them as Bulma tells the boys that it's fine. Future Gohan locks eyes for a second with his younger self. His hair slips back to black, and he turns away from his father's giddy smile. Goku excitedly says that he wants to spar with a Super Saiyan, but the older Gohan ignores him, breathing slowly and deeply while staring out the window. The twins ask if Goku wants to fight them instead. With clear disappointment, Goku agrees, but then does a double take. As they turn to head out, their hair effortlessly sparks up, bright golden. Jinbei excitedly asks the younger Gohan if he wants to join them, but he declines. Deciding he's had enough sitting around, Krillin gets up and says that he'll have a go. Bulma, Chi-Chi, and the two Gohans remain inside. They give them the medicine for Goku's heart virus, with instructions to make sure he takes it. As the racket outside turns into thundering booms and crashes, drowning out the conversation, Bulma turns to her Gohan and asks if he could please take her to Capsule Corp. She really wants to see her parents again. They step outside to see a bruised and shirtless, present-day and Super Saiyan Goku, and a massive turquoise Ozaru grinning ear to ear at each other as they exchange blows. Krillin is off by the river, nodding sagely at little Goku as the boy moves through some sort of technique, a thin disk of energy zipping back and forth across the water. Gohan turns to his younger self. He pulls something out of his vest and hands it to the innocent boy he can barely remember being. Unwrapping it, the younger Gohan finds a very familiar-looking, if not tattered and torn, notebook. Gingerly, he opens it and flips through the dried, crusty pages, seeing his own handwriting. Then more much more. Bidding farewell to his parents and Krillin, the future Son family gather and promptly vanish. They appear first at the small warehouse again, before vanishing and then reappearing at the old Capsule Corp headquarters. They are met by not only the younger Bulma, but her parents and sister too. While Dr. Briefs is unfazed, Panchi and Tights are a bit shocked at the sight of Bulma's future self, let alone her family. Arriving back in their future, they are surprised to see that nothing has changed. Bulma supposes that they have just created a branch in their original timeline. Probably for the best, though, as otherwise there might be two versions of everybody. Corin is over the moon when Akamu hands him a pouch and a small, odd-looking planter pot with to Corin from Corin written on it. The city continues to be rebuilt, and the Son Dojo's ranks grow beyond its original capacity, with all the orphaned children that join. As they bring in new masters, the dojo shifts to more of a school. Students learn normal school curriculum, a variety of martial arts, and how to draw out their key from masters Akumu and Korin. Grandmaster Gohan then takes the top students even further. Eventually, the school splinters, creating other intermediate schools in other cities. At some point, Akumu takes leave for a while, returning several months later with an intricately carved jade sculpture of a dragon. After the birth of Gohan and Bulma's daughter, Panch, the Sun School and Capsule Corp host the somewhat delayed 25th World Martial Arts Tournament. The tournament takes a few weeks to wind up, as it involves qualifying matches, just like in the old Dragon Ball days. There are many key active schools now, and while competition is strong, the Sun School takes many of the available slots in both the junior and adult divisions. Bulma is surprised to see the old and cybernetically augmented General Tao Pai Pai waiting with all the other contestants all of whom seem to be avoiding him, probably due to those cybernetics. Gohan follows her gaze, and he looks at the stoic mercenary. A shiver runs down his spine as he takes in the cybernetics, but he can sense the man just fine. Very calm, very controlled. However, when the junior division finalists, Goku and Jinbei, take the stage, General Tao pales and looks around nervously. 
Meeting his eye, Gohan notices the symbol on Tao and his muscle-bound companion's foreheads, and recognizes it as that new school from, uh, North City, was it? He hadn't heard of the Majin school prior to the tournament, but if it means more capable fighters to defend the world, all the better. As little Goku and Jinbei clash, they keep their ki suppressed, both as practice and to limit damage. The calmer, more controlled Goku has the clear edge, and eventually wins with a ring out. Two pale-skinned, antennaless Namekian types have also entered the tournament, with no affiliation at all. Akumu and Akujin are watching them uneasily, as they in turn watch the older, Sun School members pick off their competition one by one. Finally, a young woman steps up onto the platform, along with General Tao. Though highly skilled, the mercenary is ultimately beaten back to the edge of the arena. Backed into a corner like this, General Tao removes his hand. He fires a dodon paw at the surprised girl, but she catches it with her hands and deflects it up and away. She glances over at her master, who gives a slight nod. She plants her feet and cups her hands. Another of Gohan's students calls out to his companions to come and watch as Videl calls out that iconic word. Well, things went quite differently with the whole group of them. Gohan has met his mother again and received some measure of closure there. Will the past Gohan be able to decipher the increasingly chaotic scribbles in his future self's notebook? Can this save them from the androids and Cyber Vegeta? What lies ahead for the young Videl? She's been a student at the Son School for around seven years now, and her fighting skills were more than a match for the old General Tao. But will the high energy of the Kamehameha draw any unwanted attention? Find out next time on Dragon Ball. What if Vegeta killed Gohan?